talk about the global ocean atmosphere climate teleconnections, uh, some of the um, things we've found within my research group over the last couple of years. This has become an enormous topic of research uh, with people um, seeking to understand how the tropical oceans interact with each other and also how the tropics teleconnect to high latitudes. And if I get enough time today, I'm going to go back the other way and show you how the very high latitudes in the southern hemisphere can actually um, feed back and influence the tropics and right up to the North Atlantic. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining. I'm really glad to be here, even though it's late at night. I'm sure some people are up super early in the morning. So thank you for either staying up late, getting up early, or um, just taking time out of your workday. So in this tour around the global um, climate teleconnections I just referred to, I'm going to start off in the North Atlantic, which is not a bad place to start, because I think most of the audience are located. This is a good time zone to be joining this talk. And I think all of you are familiar with this overturning circulation in the North Atlantic and the fact that in, in past climate states, it's been sometimes off or, or at a reduced magnitude. And we know that this affects the climate in profound ways. We know that as the overturning circulation in the North Atlantic slows down, you get a dramatic cooling in the North Atlantic. But we know a lot less about what other global climate phenomena can arise when that overturning circulation slows down. And this is, of course, relevant for future climate change, too, because if you look at this bottom panel here, future um, projections of virtually every single CMIP 6 or CMIP 5 model, uh, none show an increase of this overturning circulation. Pretty much all of them show a decline over time. And we're expecting that to um, be even worse when you incorporate the ice sheet melt. These simulations, of course, um, don't include the ice sheet melt over Greenland, so that should even um, exacerbate the simulations without the ice sheet melt resolved. So we are expecting the overturning to slow down. And so the question is, what will that do to the global climate system apart from cooling the North Atlantic. And so in this work with one of my grad students, Brian Pinto and Andrea Tischetto uh, from the CCRC, we did a very simple thing, and many of you will be familiar with this kind of uh, approach in a coupled model. You take the full-blown coupled climate model, and what you do is you apply melt water. I've got a little watering can here uh, down the bottom left panel. Um, and uh, that, that hosing that you impose in the North Atlantic progressively leads to a collapse. And so if we run forward in time. Oh, my point is going. You just have to go without any pointer options. I'll, I'll talk to the panels as I go in, in place of the laser pointer. So in the lower left panel there, you can see that over time, this um, overturning circulation collapses when we hose the North Atlantic. And we and as you get towards even just 50 years after that initial meltwater perturbation, you have uh, an off state for the overturning circulation. And in the lower right panel, you can see that this is a, this has a profound impact on the um, Atlantic heat transport. And so in the present day climate, you can see the um, overturning is very, uh, very much generates a, a huge poleward transport of heat into the far North Atlantic. When you switch off the overturning, that heat transport pretty much collapses to near zero values um, in relation to the on state we have today. And so what does this do to the climate system? This diagram just shows you the transient response. It's nothing that a lot of you would not have seen before. Um, you basically get a cooling over the North Atlantic and it develops very rapidly over a multi-decadal period. You get up to 10 degrees Celsius global average cooling just where the overturning circulation occurs. And because this is because of this absence of heat transport northward as you shut down the conveyor belt. And there's a famous Hollywood um, blockbuster sci-fi made about this. Um, but it does a lot of other things to the global climate system. In this lower uh, right panel, you see there's actually a residual buildup of heat that accumulates in the South Atlantic Ocean when you slow down the overturning circulation. And, and when you do that, you start to rearrange atmospheric circulation. And this diagram is a schematic, and I'll show you a diagram for the model in a second. But when you start to accumulate heat in the, in the, in the tropical Atlantic Ocean, by virtue of slowing down this overturning, you generate a significant upward flux of, of um, uh, upward convection in the atmosphere. And so you change the, the zonal circulation cell. So the walker circulation in the Pacific gets affected as well. But initially this warm uh, patch of, of um, water in the South Atlantic that you can see uh, where that green arrow originates from, that's driving this huge upward draft of, of air. And that actually then descends over the Eastern Pacific Ocean. You can see that descent just to the uh, west of, of the Americas, and that drives an accelerated trade wind field. And, and that connection from the South Atlantic, there's a couple of papers that have been written about that, uh, not just by, with, from people in my group, but also from others that show this connection from the Atlantic into the Pacific Ocean. And so the teleconnections already crossed uh, into the adjacent basin into the Pacific Ocean. 
And if I, sh if I show you the global distribution of winds in response, so this top panel shows you how the wind fields respond to this shutdown of the overturning. There's a massive response in the far North Atlantic in response to the changed temperature fields, but that actually um, drives the, the up upward movement of air over the South Atlantic I just mentioned. It drives a subsidence over the East Pacific, and that then sees an acceleration of the trade winds um, blowing across the Pacific Ocean in that top panel. I'm just going to try to, I'm pointing so much as I go through this talk, and you can't see my pointer. I'm going to give it one more go. Still no pointer. No, okay. Not to worry. Okay, so the top panel shows you the wind fields and the sea level pressure, and the bottom panel shows you the the walker circulation. So this is altitude on the y-axis and longitude along the x-axis. And you can see that that blue in the lower panel, that blue in the Atlantic shows you the upward movement of air, and then the descent is that in those red colors over the Pacific Ocean. And, and that whole cell there over the Pacific is the walker circulation accelerating in response to the AMOC slowdown. And we're excited by this result because if you look at the last 40 or so years of, of um, measurements of the climate system, um, the, there is evidence that the AMOC has slowed, slowed down considerably. Um, and there's also, also evidence of this specific uh, trade wind acceleration over mm -hmm. the 70s through to the last, you know, until the early, well, around 2010, 2014, when the IPO uh, switched phase again. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't stop there because this, this piling up of warm water in the top panel, you can see the trade winds blowing across the Pacific. That piles up extra warm water in the Pacific warm pool. And you can see this blue, red, blue pattern stretching out to the Amazon Sea low uh, region. So in in that top panel um, from the Pacific warm pool north of Australia, that, that that's blue in, in sea level pressure, which means lower sea level, that's because of warmer ocean temperatures, and that drives a Rossby wave teleconnection right to the Amundsen Sea. And so we ended up summarizing this uh, in, in a diagram. I've extended this schematic off to the east, uh, off to the west now, and you can see um, all of the pieces of the teleconnection. So the, starting at the top, of the diagram, the AMOC uh, slows down, it generates this cooling. There's a residu residual buildup of heat in the South Atlantic, and that drives an upward movement of uh, air in the atmosphere, subsidence over the East Pacific, accelerated trade winds, uh, a warm pool, uh, accumulation of heat in the warm pool, and then this Rossby wave teleconnection to the Amund Amundsen Sea low. Um, that all happens pretty quickly because most of these teleconnection loops are in the atmosphere, so it's not like it's a multi-century sort of bipolar seesaw thing that happens within the deep ocean. This teleconnection from the far North Atlantic to Antarctica uh, is, is via the atmosphere and, and occurs on the, on the time scale of decades. Um, there is a, you know, obviously a, a decade or two for the heat to build up in the South Atlantic. The other, the other teleconnections are much more rapid than that. They occur on, on time scales of, of months. I hope everything's okay. I can hear some audio, but it's probably shout out Trevor if there's any technical problems. Otherwise, I'll assume no, it's okay. all good. It's all good. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so that's that's this global teleconnection um, to lead off this talk. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut now to the southern hemisphere a little bit and talk a bit about how this tropical warm pool that I've just um, started off um, in terms of this Rossby wave teleconnection to the Amundsen Sea low. I'm going to talk a little bit about that loop. Before I get there, I'll just summarize uh, the evidence, if you like, of, of why this might be playing out in today's climate. There's a couple of papers shown here. One is this, you know, and there's plenty of papers on this AMOC slowdown in the far North Atlantic. And there's, and there's ev clearly evidence of a warming in the tropical Atlantic in the recent few decades. A lot of that's driven by greenhouse gas, you know, accumulation of warmth in the system. And this teleconnection into the, into the Pacific Ocean has been well established by several authors. We had a paper out on the trade wind acceleration a couple of years ago, and then also it's it's well known that the Amundsen Sea low has deepened in the last few decades. And so each of these bits of this teleconnection are playing out. Um, it, it, so it, it's it's tempting to think that you know superimposed on this big global warming signal that we have, that there are these sort of multi-decadal um, changes playing out that are that are part of the internal climate system um, superimposed on that. Um, very significant change from greenhouse gas forcing. Okay, so now into the southern hemisphere. I want to talk a bit about this uh, wave three number pattern, and it became quite uh, notable in the climate system. 
a couple of years ago. Uh, some of you will have seen this this research come out uh, a couple of years ago about this big decline. So in this top uh, left panel, you see a, a gradual buildup of Antarctic sea ice over the satellite record until about 2016. And that itself was the topic of a lot of research. You know, why exactly uh, was the Antarctic sea ice expanding on average when the Arctic was declining so rapidly? Uh, and then it, it took a lot of people by surprise that in uh, around 2015 or so, there was a, a, the start of a big decline that, that happened over, the, over about the course of about 18 months. And, and Antarctic sea ice extent went back to pretty much where it was at the start of the satellite record. And this big decline in sea ice has been linked to this wave free pattern that you can see in the lower panel, the highs and lows there in the atmosphere. Uh, it's a dominant mode of variability at that latitude and, and work by uh, a couple of authors there listed, Wang et al. 2019, Jerry Meal et al. 2019, and, and R.A.M. Purik and myself the same year, linked this uh, wave three pattern back into the tropical Indian Ocean. And it got me thinking a bit about this wave three pattern because it's been around in the literature for about uh, for almost 50 years or so. Harry Van Loon was the first person to, to talk about it. And it's shown in this sort of schematic type diagram on the right here. And when Harry first spoke about this wave three pattern, he, he um, postulated that it was due to the land ocean geometry of the Southern Hemisphere. That's to say we've got three big land masses and three big masses of ocean. And the ocean and the atmosphere, uh, you know, interact with each other in a different way to the land surface and the atmosphere. And he, he uh, you know, hypothesized that this wave three pattern that you see as a, as a dominant um, mode of variability at these latitudes was due to the land mass configuration uh, in that in the southern hemisphere. And, and when we dug through the literature, this uh, work's been uh, undertaken by my grad student, Rishaf Goyle from the University of New South Wales. He's done a great job with this project. He, he, uh, we went through the literature looking for anybody to test this hypothesis, and we couldn't see any study that really sort of systematically built up from, an, uh, from a, say, an aquaplanet model and, and sequentially, sequentially added land masses to try to understand, you know, is this wave three pattern that you can see on the right here, is it due to these land masses or is it some other phenomenon that gives rise to that pattern? And so it's a, it's a fun thing to do, um, go looking for this signal because you can, you know, in model world, you can basically turn your, your world into an ocean covered planet. This is not about raising sea level by many hundreds of meters. It's just about going into a simulation and and uh, setting the surface of that of the uh, Earth to be all ocean covered, um, and when we did that in this simulation in this atmosphere only simulation, we get virtually no wave three pattern. The only minimal signal there you can vaguely make out on the screen is just due to the sun hitting the um, the surface of the Earth in discrete time steps as you run through the model four hour time step. It's not um, a very big signal at all. When we added land masses in a way that, say, Harry had postulated might have given rise to the wave three pattern. So just in the extra tropics with orography, so so with the mountain ranges along the along the Andes in South America, we didn't really get much of a signal either. There's a tiny increase in the signal. It wasn't until we added any kind of tropical anomaly. So in this final simulation here, there just happens to be a bit of land added, as you can see in this lower right panel, a bit of land over South America. and. We ran, I should say, Rishav ran tens of experiments, um, changing the land masses, adding Antarctica with and without mountain ranges, um, adding land masses in the tropics at different locations. And it turned out that, that really the only thing that, that you need to trigger a wave three pattern was any kind of tropical convection signal. Um, and the reason is, is that out of the tropics, and so the, the biggest source of tropical, um, of a, of a, a tropical convection signal is in the maritime continent. So the same region I spoke about a couple of slides ago for the North Atlantic teleconnection. So north of Australia, big warm pool in, in that top uh, panel here generates a, a, a deep convection event in the atmosphere. And so once you generate this deep convection event in the atmosphere, uh, it, it sends a Rossby wave signal to higher latitudes. Um, that Rossby wave propagates westward. Um, but of course, the, the background circulation is, is the eastward flowing jet. So the westerly winds are flowing uh, from west to east, the Rossby waves are propagating against that. And so you get a standing wave pattern and it's the wave three pattern that um, most resonates, if you like, with the jet speed. And so um, it's not at all to do with the land masses. The land masses are, are rather almost oblivious to the wave three pattern, but you need the convection to hit 
uh, a Rossby wave signal that to, to, to teleconnect to high latitudes. And that then gives you uh, this sort of quasi stationary pattern. It's not completely stationary. It wobbles around over a sort of 20 degree longitude range. Um, but, but in certain years, this is such a strong pattern that it can, it can give you significant climate anomalies over Antarctica. So these, uh, this is like a geopotential height map down the bottom here. And you can imagine then the north-south winds are, are, rem are remarkably strong in between these geopotential signals, geopotential height signals that I'm showing. If you think about uh, geostrophy, you just have um, circulation around those those highs and lows. And, and so the meridional wind field can be quite strong. And so, yeah, this was a fun project to sort of uncover this wave three signal um, and to sort of link it back to the tropics. Because then if you think about how uh, climate change is going to play out, you might expect that as we warm the planet, and, and warm and get extra convection out of the maritime continent that there may be changes in this wave three pattern. Um, and, and you wouldn't necessarily get those changes if the, if it was the land masses that were creating the signal. So it's it's very much convection out of the tropics that, that gives you that wave three pattern. Um, according to my time, I've got maybe three or four minutes to wrap up or five minutes maybe for questions. Oh no, we're, we're doing quite well. Um, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna have enough time to loop back to the North Atlantic after all. Okay, so the last piece of work I wanted to show you in this theme of teleconnections of signals around the global climate system is to uh, start off in the southern hemisphere this time and work our way back into the North Atlantic. And some of you may have know, may know of the work from Robbie Togweiler, Joellen Russell and others who um, have linked southern hemisphere westerly winds to the overturning circulation in the North Atlantic. Uh, the, the famous paper by Samuels, uh, Bo Bonnie Samuels and, and, and Robbie Togwaller came out 25 or so years ago. And it's fascinated many people since that this teleconnection between the Southern Ocean winds driving changes in the North Atlantic. And what we did in this study was try to understand the mechanisms that give you that teleconnection. Um, it follows on from work, which is kind of a surprising follow on when you think about it. Um, right up against the Antarctic margin a couple of years ago, we looked at the propagation of Kelvin waves around the Antarctic continent. And we showed in this lower left panel led by Paul Spence that uh, around, the, around the Antarctic continent, when you generate wind anomalies, this creates um, sea level elevation anomalies around the continent. And you know, basic GFD tells you when you have a sea level elevation against a coast in the Southern hemisphere, it'll propagate as a Kelvin wave around the coast with the continent on the left. And that's shown in these top panels here, these, these purple uh, signatures is tracking Kelvin wave propagation around Antarctica. And so when Dave Webb started his PhD about three or four years ago, that was the initial problem we looked at was to look at these Kelvin waves around Antarctica and, and what kind of conditions they, they, they propagate in, what features of the Antarctic coastline disperse those waves into Poincare waves and other, other, other different waves off the coast. Um, and one of the things he found early on was that you get this jet jump, this uh, signal jumping across the Drake Passage. So that um, panel, the right hand panel with the purple colors there, uh, that, that case you can see that purple signal going up the Americas into the North Atlantic from the Southern Ocean, just from a wind anomaly right up against the coast of Antarctica. And that idea is not old. So Dave Marshall and Helen Johnson a couple of years ago uh, put out a diagram, this schematic on the right here, this planetary waveguide making this link uh, via coastal trap Kelvin waves up the coast of South America, becoming equatorial Kelvin waves that cross the equator and make it to the African continent. And then with the coast on their right, because rotation affects swap sign either side of the equator, you then get Kelvin waves propagating up, up towards Europe and then Rossby waves go into the interior and, and uh, they change mix layers and so on. I'll get to that in a second. And so uh, in this work, what, what we did was start to, to play around with these wind anomalies like what Robbie Togwaller would have applied years ago but we rather than just looking at the sort of the end final equilibrium with these wind anomalies we actually trace the the transient adjustment of the ocean so looking for these waves trying to see exactly how the wind anomalies we apply make their way up the continent and we could see this coastal trap kelvin wave uh, make its way up the americas we could track a kelvin wave across the uh atlantic to the western uh, so to the west coast of, of africa and then making its way up the eastern boundary of the ocean into the North Atlantic. And what it does, what this waveguide does is it propagates these signals on, on a very short time scale. So on the left here shows the time series out in years. So from 
one year forward to 15 years, and it's a signal of the Atlantic overturning anomaly. And this, this blue dash curve, for example, shows you a, a big anomaly that kicks in only after about four years time. And it, it sees the, the overturning stream function increase by about four sverdrops in the North Atlantic. So we're hitting, we're hitting the Southern Ocean with a decent sized wind. We're adding, you know, plus 15% to the wind stress. That creates a sea level anomaly up against the coast of Argentina. It propagates as a coastal trap Kelvin wave. This cartoon at the very bottom right that you can see, it propagates up as a, a coastal trap Kelvin wave and then finally into the far North Atlantic. And, and when it does this, it actually, uh, any, any propagating planetary wave like that, if it's a baroclinic wave, it starts to raise the, the mix layer depth up or down as it propagates. And, and so whilst a part of the signal is initially a sort of barotropic mode, it does become a, a, a baroclinic signal across the equatorial Pacific Ocean, uh, sorry, the equatorial Atlantic Ocean. And, and these waves that propagate across from Europe, that blue um, dash curve in the very bottom right cartoon, and those red downwelling Kelvin waves, they do actually displace the mix layer uh, in the ocean. And when you displace the mixed layer in the North Atlantic, you've got to remember that the Atlantic region here, you know, you're forming deep water when these very cold winds come off the land mass and lead to big evaporative heat loss out of the ocean. And a shallower mixed layer loses heat and, and gains saltiness much easier than a deeper mixed layer. And so these variations in the depth of the mixed layer that you get in the formation sites um, trigger big changes in the water mass properties in the surface mix layer. And so you get heat flux anomalies and you get anomalies in temperature and salinity. And so you get a convection event that maybe is deeper or shallower as a function of these propagating waves. Um, and so uh, in this work, uh, we, we, that was the main feature of, of what drove this increase in the, in the formation of North Atlantic deep water. Basically, um, these waves that, that bring the, the mixed layer to a shallower depth exposes a shallower layer to air sea heat loss and evaporation, so gain salinity, driving convective overturn to, to depth and then changing the overturning stream function. Um, the other thing that goes on in this um, propagation of, of signal up the coast is that there is also a barotropic wave um, that makes its way up relatively quickly because th these propagate globally within... Uh, within a day or two. So they're, they're very fast traveling. Of course, you need the wind in the southern hemisphere to build up a significant sea level anomaly. So um, you don't necessarily get a deep signal uh, instantaneously. But as, as, as we apply this wind anomaly over the southern hemisphere, the, the sea level, you know, d decline, you know, drops in time. And so these barotropic, uh, barotropic Kelvin waves and eventually Rossby waves make their way around the, around the margin. And and so the flow response here, this red um, diagram on the left, shows you the barotropic flow response. And these, these reds here show increased barotropic flow. And when you have that along, a, along a, um, the bottom of the ocean, it drives an Ekman flow response um, shown in the schematic on the left. And that can then also change the overturning circulation by affecting the properties over the shelf. Okay, I wanted to leave some time for questions. It was a, a bit of a whirlwind tour across um, really three different studies, but the idea of this talk was to sort of showcase some of the ways that the global climate system can um, teleconnect signals um, from one location, starting off in the North Atlantic, right down to the Amundsen Sea uh, low, and then also vice versa, you can get anomalies around Antarctica making their way all the way back to the North Atlantic. Um, I think I've got about seven or eight minutes to leave for questions, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh